Next, I'm joined by Dr. Michael John Ackerman, the Winlin Smith Rice Cardiovascular Genomics Research Professor of Medicine and Pediatrics and Pharmacology at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota, on sports participation in athletes with heart disease. Are the guidelines too strict? Mike has been considered one of the world's experts on long QT syndrome and has recently been much more involved in trying to return people to sports. So, Mike, welcome to Axel. Just give us a short summary of your perceptions and some of the things you were emphasizing at the debate yesterday. Great. Thanks, Dr. Beauvais. And I'm really excited to spend some time with you and our audience because this is a really important issue. I think what we had in our debate yesterday was a really interesting and obviously intense debate on the guidelines and the various guidelines that we as physicians and as cardiologists refer to when we guide our patients with and these athletes with these return to play decisions. And so we obviously yesterday debated the European Society of Cardiology Guidelines. I took the position that they were too strict. Participated with Drs. Marin and Zipes in the 2005 Bethesda Conference Guidelines, which is the last iteration. And it's up for review because we know that there's work to do. We admitted in our American guidelines that it was based largely on individual judgments, collective opinions, invoking the art of medicine, and that the level of true evidence that went into the recommendations was not robust. And now we're seven years since those last guidelines, and it needs to be revisited. And I think from my standpoint, there are several issues. First, we need to stop thinking about athletes with heart disease but athletes with a specific heart disease. And what do we know about that specific heart disease and the specific risk associated with being an athlete with that heart disease? Because it's not a one-size-fits-all. And for the most part, the guidelines have been a lumper rather than a splitter, which basically has said, if your heart is not perfect, if you have one of these various diseases, then you are restricted from virtually all competitive sports. And we sort of carved out a save haven in the Bethesda guidelines of six sports, billiards, bowling, cricket, curling, golf, riflery, which was two more than in the European guidelines. But we sort of said, no matter what your heart disease is, this is at most all you can do. And I think what we have to do is start asking ourselves, what's the strength of the evidence? If the evidence is weak, are we conveying that, the relative strength or the weakness of the evidence to the athlete and to his or her family when we're having these discussions? Because they have the right to know whether our recommendation is based on our art, our philosophy, or on science. The second thing is then we have to ask ourselves, what's our role as a physician with these guidelines? The guidelines should guide us, but I don't think we should be viewing the guidelines as mandates. And do we view that our duty as a cardiologist is to disqualify? Or is it our duty to inform, educate, and allow the family, the athlete, to be a part of this very difficult decision? I mean, after all, nobody knows how high the stakes are more than the family. If a mom or dad is going to be willing to entertain the ability for their child to remain an athlete for a heart disease that predisposes to sudden death, they know full well that they may be enabling a tragedy. These parents know how high the stakes are. So don't they have a right to be part of this very difficult decision? And we just provided evidence to show that at least for one disease, long QT syndrome, which we published our experience in JAMA earlier this year, that for that disease managed in one specific center called Mayo Clinic, that those athletes who made the decision to stay an athlete, they and their families, that that has not seemed to be an excessively risk-taking behavior or a reckless risk-taking behavior because the event rates among those diagnosed and treated athletes has been extremely low. And maybe that means for that disease that we now have the beginnings of evidence to frame their level of risk. And we need to look at it for every disease within the guidelines and ask, what's the evidence? Where's the beef? Well, thanks. That's a very good summary. And I can tell you that when you look at different levels of sports, professional sports, for example, where 
the team basically pays for the athlete, they have a bigger decision role in whether to accept that or not. So the athlete plus the the team gets involved. And I guess the same may occur at the college level sometimes, that they feel some responsibility to make sure that they're not putting an athlete at risk. And at that level, right, we talk with the families who, if they're making from their worldview a decision that they understand the risks and they want to stay an athlete, now it goes into a second tier. There's no covert athletes with heart disease in our program, for example, meaning the terms of engagement are the school needs to know, the coaches need to know, and they need to be on board with it. And that if they're not on board and the university says, sorry, we don't care what you and your physician has decided in your covenant relationship, we're the institution and we do not accept this risk. We don't want to take on this risk. Well, then that's their prerogative and we have to respect the right of an institution to weigh in and either agree with it or say, no, we're not going to allow that. And then that's the next layer after a family becomes fully informed to say, do they or do they not want to continue in their sport of choice? Yeah. And I think you emphasize another very important point. This is a variety of diseases, not a single disease. You could say that a cardiologist should be versed in all of these diseases, but at the same time, There's a variety of levels of skill, and I think the emphasis would be if you want to be involved in assessment of athletes for return to sport with some identified cardiac disorder, you ought to know the key issues that are involved in the various disorders. I mean, you mentioned long QT. We've got hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. We've got RV dysplasia. We've got, you know, Wolf, Parkinson, White. There's a bunch of things that really a cardiologist has to have intrinsic knowledge, not just of the fact that these things exist, but of how they act in the athletic world. And if they don't, they need to tell the families that. They need to say that this disease and your situation is not my sweet spot. And here's where we need to get you. And we have to be very careful that say, for example, our Mayo Clinic experience with my and our long QT patients isn't viewed as a freedom and a license to play for every long QT kid adult out there. Because what if they have been inadequately counseled, inadequately risk stratified, inadequately treated? We could set ourselves up for a problem. And the second thing that would be very dangerous is for people to think that this long QT experience where it looks like the risk is low and perhaps acceptably low. In other words, I've actually had more events in my non-athlete long QT patients than my athletes, but that doesn't mean that this then is going to be the story for ARVC or hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And it would be very wrong for somebody to say, wow, the event rate was low for long QT patients. I guess it's probably low for these other diseases as well. No, the people with these other diseases, we need to do our homework and figure out what's the risk of that activity in that disease setting. And I think that's one of the mistakes we've made is lumping everything together as athletes with heart disease as one entity. It begs the issue of whether we ought to have some special training programs for people that would like to become identified as a cardiologist that knows how to deal with athletes. Because as you say, this is not day-to-day cardiology. It's much more complex, requires much more intrinsic knowledge of the literature and an approach to family and athlete and to the institution like a college or a pro team much more so than most people are used to. And in fact, we had recently, as I mentioned, our sports cardiology symposium at Hardhouse, and this did come up. How do we get ourselves trained to be able to manage these kind of issues in an appropriate and effective way? We keep subdividing ourselves into more and more subspecialty board exams, but maybe there should be some kind of a component of training. There is a sports medicine board that is focused an awful lot on orthopedics, you know, not on medical or cardiovascular things. And maybe that's the place to go to create a curriculum. That's a discussion I think we should have over time is what is the right training for a physician and particularly a cardiologist? Because I will say my own experience is that if it's a heart problem, they want to talk to a cardiologist, you know, and any cardiologist can sound like they know what they're doing. But you're right. It's a complex issue with all the different diagnoses that could be out there. For sure. And we for sure should not have any cardiologists releasing or enabling or not preventing a long QT athlete to stay a long QT athlete as the same a patient with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, that may be a different game altogether. But the point would be that given our bandwidth, we might be able to counsel 
with a direction towards more freedom for an athlete with long QT to stay an athlete because of what we're observing now, what the evidence is becoming. And we also might be directing a decision towards disqualification for athletes with other diseases where we're more concerned based on evidence that that disease, that that sport might be an accelerant to the disease or excessively dangerous. But the point is, we've got to know this. We have to respect, potentially respect their right to make this very, very difficult decision. Yeah, right. I agree. So, as I said, it begs the issue for some special training. It begs the issue for registries of athletes and events and athletes and non-events, if you want to have the right registry. So, let me thank you for being here. I, I think that this topic is very, very active in discussion around the country right now, and your contributions have been very important to the whole conversation. So, I appreciate you spending some time with Axel, and we'll, I'm sure, get back on this topic again in a year or so and review what new data has come out. I'm looking forward to it. Thanks a lot.